All right, we're going to call this meeting to order. Good morning. It's 8.30 a.m. on Tuesday, April 11th, 2023. And this is the meeting of the Sandpoint Arts, Culture, and Preservation Commission, and it's now called to order. Uh, for the record, I am Chairwoman Ellen Cessnas, presiding at the City of Cessnas. Well, I like you know. that. <laughs> <laughs> City of Sandpoint Council Chambers, 111, no, 1123 in Lake Street in Sandpoint, Idaho. Commission members present or absent are Barry Burgess, uh, Keely Gray, Hannah Combs, uh, Karen Wiedemeyer, uh, Caitlin Chuck is on Zoom. And is Mike Lithgow on yet? Oh, he is. Perfect timing. Hi, Mike. Oh, that was Mike Lithgow is on Magic. Zoom. Uh, Rick Decker is absent, and Woody Sherwood is absent at this time. All right, onward to the meeting minutes approval, 3A. Uh, we will now proceed with the approval of minutes from commission's last meeting. I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes from March 14th, 2023 meeting. Uh, may I have that motion? Keely puts it forward. Is there a second? And a second. All in favor? Uh, Caitlin and Mike have affirmed. Any opposed? Nope. None opposed, so the motion passes. Thank you very much. All right. For uh, A, the financial report. Uh, this is the Sandpoint Urban Renewal Agency, the SURA financial report as of March 29th. 2023. Uh, the arts fund in the downtown district is approximately 144,000. In the northern district, it's approximately 79,000. Uh, the silver box project event to date is about 14,000, and the remaining balance is about 5,000. All right, we're moving really fast. So, uh, Jennifer. Uh, we'll be here in a few minutes to give her presentation, but in the meantime, let's jump on to old business. Uh, 6A, Heather, can you give us an update on the NEA ARP subgrant program? Absolutely. Oh, and Woody has just arrived. Good morning. Good morning, Woody. Thank you, sorry. So um, just an update, I'm continuing to work with the nonprofits on um, the narratives, and we're going to hopefully come to a close with all of those on April 14th. Um, many of them are closing out at that point. Others are at their semi-annual report stage, um, but things are going well, and um, it's exciting because I believe all of this is just the foundation to more opportunities with capacity building and subgrants. So things are going really well. All right. Are there any questions for Heather on the current process? All right. Let's move on then uh, to 6B, the cultural collective campaign. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen here just as a reminder. Um, and what I... <clears throat> here. What I wanted to do today with the cultural campaign, let me get to the PowerPoint presentation I did a while back. I wanted your guys' input. So <clears throat> we've talked about, about it um, here and there, um, what, how it will work, how it's a partnership with the museum, um, We've had an opportunity to do one uh, with Carol Diener, which is very exciting. So we got our feet wet with that. And um, I am going to be continuing to, to do them. I will um, be connecting with Ross Hall Jr. soon. And he would like to talk about um, his family's involvement and his memories on the Bay Trail. So I definitely, I'm, I'm seeing it really um, complement everything we're doing to for the city. It certainly makes sense that we align it with a project that's happening 
or and someone that has an interesting story that they want to share. I love that it's continually building oral histories in our community, building the museum's archives. It's a great resource for the city to use. I feel like every project here at the city needs like a history page. And the more that the community is heard and can be featured in projects with their history, I think is really important. So um, everybody is excited at the city about it. Um, and I had a really great conversation with Jennifer and what she was looking for from me recently is more of a rollout with it. So um, what would be the elevator speech and why are we using it? And so I just wanted your guys' feedback on let's take what, what this is and what's the dream, the ultimate goal that we can, you know, do with this project. And if, I, if you guys could help me expand a little bit more on this idea. Okay. Just something off the top of my head mm -hmm. is um, a lot of what's going on with all of the changes that are happening in Sandpoint right now, I think it's really important that, like I think you touched on this, that the community feel heard and not forgotten and left. Um, so I think this could do a dual purpose with that in regard of maintaining and preserving the culture that <laughs> has been established here in Sandpoint, because we always talk about how spectacular and wonderful and welcoming our community is and how we're trying to hold on to that as all these changes and developments are happening. Um, and so if there's a way to kind of merge, I think it's a perfect way to merge it so that, um, you know, citizens can feel like, you know, the place where we grew up is still Sandpoint. And I'm, I'm not exactly sure how to verbalize that, but absolutely, that makes sense. it That's definitely does. Sense. And when people are saying we need to preserve our community character and we're using that magnificent buzzword, what, what defines our community character, right? Like what we need to understand the what behind that. And Hannah, I thought your exhibit was really great where you go all the way and then you land on it. And I mean, I kind of walked away with it evoking more thought about what is our character of the community. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I love for me a big uh, positive with this idea is it brings whatever winds up on this platform, whether it's oral histories or like maps or information about historic properties, it's a way to bring that information out of the museum archives into a platform where it's more accessible to the community. Um, I have run across a few, a couple um, possible grant opportunities for that type of like digital accessibility. Oh, fabulous. If we do need funding for the like technical back end of this project. So that'd be possible. wonderful. That's exciting. Yeah. And so with, with it being, a partnership in the museum. I know my history with the museum and exhibits, mm -hmm. being able to like the the fun meat of that exhibit was oral histories. Yeah. So you're talking about how it can you can roll out more outside exhibits mm -hmm. with that and in more hi yeah. historic and informative moments. Right. And I think that's gonna be something we'll have to figure out is, is this more of a, like an online database where someone can go and say, I want to listen to that oral history of Carol Diener and just click on that and listen to it all the way through? Or is it something that we curate more? Like, do you want to learn more about <clears throat> the history of arts in Sandpoint? Here's some clips from Carol's plus some photos plus. So I think that'll be part of this too is, what is the end product that we're presenting? Is yeah. it more of a raw, like raw information or more of a curated presentation? I think probably curated would be the it. Yeah, definitely. Um, Although stories, we know we have to tell stories. Well, stories, yeah. we get stories so that, you know, if people see this and want to tell their stories, we should have it as that. Well, I'm having a flashback moment of the festival poster that Woods did, where it was a collection of like everybody, pictures from the festival that were conglomerated into one big picture for the poster. So and it was one of, one of the coolest things that 
um, that I did when I went there is like just searching for all of the people that I knew because it was so much fun. And I think ultimately community is a word that, um, at least for me, is has been resonating really deeply lately, especially with everything that's going on and new folks coming in and holding on to what our community is. And so, you know, knowing Carol and being like, oh, I know Carol and like hearing her story, I think is really cool. And I think if we have, if we can pull from a lot of locals that have been here, even like maybe not as long term as Carol, but even like someone like from my generation, like who was in high school when the rope swing was around. Mm -hmm. You yes. know what I mean? Like has like and when Dirty Harold's was around, Harold's IGA. Oh, I like Dirty Harold's. I was oh, like, yeah. Hmm? yeah. Ben and I, Ben and I have so many conversations about do you remember this? And do you remember mm -hmm. that? And how cool was this? And so um just that kind of knowing that we're a part of it and that we're a part of the fabric, um, I think is I love important. that. Um so that brings me to thinking, of course, we, we know there's particular leaders within a special category in our community, for instance, Carol and public art, and we were working on understanding public art, but would there be like a coffee hour or IPA hour, <laughs> there you, go. Oh, you know, wow. that where we can sit down and anyone can come join us during a certain time and and there's a theme like the rope swing. I, I don't know, is that an idea? Is that, yeah. So it's a community, yes, yeah. And I remember Will at the museum used to talk about that and how it was better when you had a room of like, quote unquote, the old timers, and then yeah. they'd start to play off of yeah. each other. Exactly. That's, I like that. Just like a monthly podcast of like, say a point history, culture. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I love this idea generation. So is it like the gathering? Is it a podcast? Um, so is there a creative a way where we can collect that information, but it's a community building moment too? Mike, Mike oh, go ahead. Uh, I keep coming back to the idea that uh, to get the community involved in things, you probably could use special events. Mm -hmm. Special events might be total action like uh, logging competition. <laughs> Designate a place where all the loggers come out and compete for a song or dinner. Well, yeah, that's our history. We are that's a logger history. community. And the Native American aspect, Mike, how do we bring the Native American aspect of early sampling or living on the river, maybe canoe races or something, whatever that happens to be. So how do you make that up and inspire other organizations come in and compete as well. So these little notions of competition always brings people on. And there's always grandstanding and there's always <laughs> and maybe the, maybe there's gambling. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to so like figuring out what events or activities already exist and how can we just yeah take our tape recorder yeah. and go be reporters. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, just trying to figure out more of what's already going on and can we capture more of that? That's a great idea. There's an awesome event that I witnessed several times uh, down in California up here too. I think it was held once here in Sandpoint some years ago. It was known as the, uh, the Kinetic Sculpture Race. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know anything about that. It began in uh, Arcata, California where a couple of guys were racing their bicycles and they felt it wasn't good enough so they they wind up building these bicycles that could withstand all kinds of things like racing in mud, racing on sand. And ultimately, people came from around, around the world to compete in this thing. And they had to compete in water, on mud or sand, and then a parade through the streets. But it brought the entire towns out, I mean, with thousands of people in the street. And then there's maybe only about 12 people competed, but they had to change the wheels each time we went from one place to another. So fantastic piece of sculpture that they bicycle. Wow. Cool. What a, a great signature that. It's people in it, but it's pedal power. Uh -huh. Wow. That's an interesting. That's very. Caitlin, did you have any comments? No. Uh, the thing that came to mind, though, was the. Uh, um, has anybody been to the regatta that the Neppers put on in the Sand Creek at the end of the summer? It's just like a total local 
local competition where you make a boat and you try to go down from the city street city city beach bridge to the cedar street bridge and back and whoever wins it's it's really really funny and awesome like that would be a cool event to bring a tape recorder to that was my only thought love that and mike what about you any comments all right well that's great any other questions on that thank you guys so much for your feedback i really appreciate it yeah we'll we'll, we'll keep flushing it out uh, ideas that's fantastic uh, all right well let's let's see let's yeah. All right, well, let's move on to 6C, the public art project teams updates. All right. Well, as uh, Heather talked before, um, we actually talked to Carol Diener and we fleshed out a little bit more of the art inventory. Um, and Carol has some more items that she'll be uh, bringing in for us so that we can, we can have more information. That was an interesting conversation for sure. Yeah, <laughs> juicy details. That's great. <laughs> um, so as far as that goes, that's where we're at on that. Um, what else do you need for the... Uh, did you guys meet about the calendar? Mm -hmm. And what came out of that? Um, uh, well, Go for it, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> like there was three of them. I think we kind of fleshed out the idea of like a... that an event calendar might not be as best serving for this particular commission because you know sampling online already kind of has that going and so does the reader and um you know there's a lot of calendars for events that already exist and uh, the more we started talking about it the idea of a nonprofit grant calendar and like funding opportunities calendar and and kind of almost a database for like how to like the local the the regional foundations that exist and what their timelines are for grant opportunities and how to access those and potentially how to walk somebody through like uei numbers and how to get how just kind of the process if your brand's making new yeah. to that or if you're you know sit, filling in a position as executive director for an organization and you need help in kind of navigating that world because there are so many nonprofits in our community um, that it would be nice if there was a resource for them to kind of uh, to get to to have the opportunities that they need to uh, be successful. Like a package. Yeah, love that. Yeah, some sort of resource to be like here. Yeah, I'm I'm finding that too. And you know, with I'm you know talking to the choir like you guys all know this because you're in it. But with the nonprofit world, you're wearing every hat. So it's the the time and bandwidth you know, that isn't always there. And I noticed that working with uh, the grants that we have um, with our nonprofit arts. And I, I keep thinking like, what, what type of package can we have there as an available resource, which it's almost like the, the um, everyone hates it when I say this, but the crib notes, you know, on, on how to navigate all of that stuff. So especially with federal grants. Yeah. That's a lot, of, a lot of us are, a lot of us are used to like, you know, Idaho Foundation or the Community Foundation or, you know, Cal. Anobia, you know what <laughs> yeah. I mean, Cal, yeah, Eagles, like we, yeah, we're yeah. all used to those local grants, um, 101 women, we're all, we're, we're all familiar with those, but when it gets to like the bigger, the bigger dogs, you know, there's a lot of stuff, like I, I UEI was, that was a thing. <laughs> um, there might be some interesting stuff through, I think, Idaho has a statewide nonprofit foundation. They do, Idaho Nonprofit Center. And um, I know one that I was familiar with in Colorado had a very, very good grant gifting guide that came through that, that group. Okay. And they would even do a thing where every year they had the state broke down into eight quadrants. And every four years, your quadrant they would do it twice a year, so so you know, so two quadrants every every four years. Mm -hmm. You got a they actually had a granting guide uh, seminar, oh, wow. you know, where they bring together then all the foundations and all the all the federal grant givers and everybody, and you just go there and there'd be a hundred different grantors, and there maybe be five hundred people at this place, and it was just like a five minute speed dating thing that was for <laughs> half a day. 
wow. and it just went from place to place trying to see if you had something that yeah. would be a match. Well, and that builds that personal relationship that exactly. we're all trying to cultivate with, with funders and donors and sponsors. But yeah. but I think that there may be some resources through this Idaho Nonprofit Foundation. I'll look into that, Woody, and I'm so glad you brought that up because I think you all are bringing up a good point. Sometimes the resources are already there. Um, and someone did bring up, actually, I think it was Kathy that was like, well, the Idaho nonprofit does a lot of that. And um, I am working closely with Dig Christmer, who's with Anovia. And immediately I started talking with her, like, is there through the ED Collab group or an expansion of that more support we can give for capacity building with some sort of resource? But I also think if I can connect with the Idaho nonprofit and see what, what they have. So maybe it's looking at what organizations do this, how can we kind of like connect people to them? And may, maybe it's through this opportunities calendar where there's the grants, but then there's the different people that do the, the different veins of support. And, and but we, we take the time to dilute it down for people. And that's kind of where our power can be. I love that. So I'll, I'll certainly, um, I'd like to work with you guys on um, getting information maybe for that calendar or we'll work together on trying to figure out what, what's out there and maybe it's as simple as that. Yeah. Perfect. Don't reinvent the wheel, it's already there. Right, it's amazing what is out there already, indeed. Um, perfect. And just a note on the inventory, um, it was really great because I we the, what we have already was a good foundation. I was able to give that as a resource to the design teams as right. they're moving forward with the design competition. <clears throat> so they have like a, a high level understanding of public art. What, what we're gonna do with Carol, and when the time comes, I'll invite you all to be a part of this. We need to kind of go for a walk, I think. Um, particularly in the healing garden and understand like this well and that is packed full of stories in there each art piece has probably a significance behind it and um, understand what is public art as in publicly owned donated to the city what is privately there but still is public facing so it's considered public art I want I want to really dissect and understand every single piece that's my goal and the the alignment is right there because Hannah, you guys are working on a scavenger hunt at the museum, is that correct? Yeah. I love that. And then you've, you've mentioned public art would be a really great thing. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> that's certainly on our list of things to do. And we'll, we'll keep um, working towards accomplishing that. So that sounds great. Anything more on the, um, the art project teams? I'm going to mention one more thing then. Um, the other one, and Karen, Caitlin, Ellie, and I were tasked with um, public art and policies, which is beyond fun, but <laughs> super necessary. And you guys are super busy um, doing amazing things, and uh, we all are, right? Um, but I, if you guys are okay with it, um, we have a historic preservation working team. Um, I think it would make sense if we brought that public art policies and procedures into that working group that meets on a weekly basis. And you guys can be a part of that. It's on Mondays at nine o'clock. Um, and I'll cue you in on that, but I, I think it would help to just get that rolling. What, I'm, what I, we've done so far is um, Ellie and I looked at it and changed the low hanging fruit moments like, Sandpoint Arts Commission is now, you know, what we all are. Um, I've also taken out procedures out of um, policy and separated those two documents so procedures can be changed more often. Um, and just so the few that were on the Art Commission that's right. now, that's kind of where we got hung up the last time we looked at it, is we were delving into the procedures and I remember it was just, it was getting a little bit deep. And so when we looked at it and we separated them, then it made a lot more sense. So I think going forward, it's actually going to be a lot um, more yeah. manageable. 
And just as a reminder, speaking of the history, this is a beautiful document that the Arts Commission worked on for a very long time. It, and this was in 2016 and it got pretty darn far and then there was a huge pause. Um, so we're gonna help get it through the finish line, which will be wonderful and super supportive as we're moving forward with public art. Um, so I'll, I'll invite you all to be a part of that, um, but just to keep our momentum going, are you guys okay with drawing that into the work team? Yeah, I am. Perfect. This is on my radar. <laughs> yeah, I think it's super busy times, right? We'll be able to get it like, oh. dialed in really fast, taking that approach. Cool. Perfect. Are there any other questions on any of the groups? All right, let's move on to Silver Fox program. Speed. Okay, so I'm gonna share another screen here. Okay, so excuse me, let me just get us out of here. Have all these fun PowerPoints. <laughs> I, I, you can ask Hannah, I wasn't, <laughs> and then I had to learn really quickly. It's become a really good tool for me because once you have it, you can use it for so many different things and thank goodness for Canva. We can all look good. <laughs> I was telling everybody, um, Killian got to my almost two year old oh. to my computer and created a black screen effect on everything. So I apologize. I don't know what to do moving forward. But I become dark. So this um, is a silver box program. And I'm gonna have Ellie team with me on um, this, but essentially it's um, an art on loan program that we have. It's a continual program that was established. At, and we have it in three locations here, which you can see on the map. Um, and I just kind of have a really high level and then I'd like you to dive into the, the weeds on it. But um, it's been a really fun program. You can see how excited the artist is there. <laughs> um, it's a way for artists to be able to promote themselves, their work. It's for sale throughout the community, the art that's on exhibit there. Um, they get paid $1,000 to have it uh, featured. And then um, if they do sell it, they get um, the money from the sales, the city takes 10%. Um, it's up for a year. And um, we've had all sorts of interesting art. The, the one thing, and you can talk to this a little bit more, Ellie, it has to withstand the outdoor elements. Um, We've kind of learned through that, but um, it, it's been a, a really fun um, journey. Would you like to kind of talk a little bit about sure. anything? So this project has uh, evolved quite a bit from where it was first uh, presented. It was presented as a uh, takeoff of a, a waterfront project in Olympia, Washington, a plank project, I believe it was called. At where it was these stainless steel boxes with rotating art. So, you know, it went through a lot of stages of where we were going to put them, how it was, was it an art on loan program, was it not? Um, we finally settled on the downtown locations because there was lots of, you know, that we were been, we've been planning master planning the city beach and all of the waterfront areas for a long time. So because there hasn't been any like action down there, we didn't want to put them down there and put them on the street. And actually I think it's been a really good thing because it puts the art up on the street where people who might not normally see it can see it when they're driving downtown, when they're walking to the post office, maybe visiting the farmer's market. Um, it just puts it right out there. So I, we've had art up for two cycles, uh, three pieces each. Um, and I think it's been really good. We've had uh, a lot of comments like the, the chicken 
Right here. Listen in a lot of interesting comments. Um, the one thing that we really have to be careful of is when we do the selection is that they are very weather worthy because we did have some problems with the checkers because it was wood and it wasn't sealed correctly. Okay. It ended up cracking, which the responsibility is on the artist, of course. But you know, when we're in selection, if we see someone has uh, uh, so, uh, you know, put a piece of art that is paper mache, obviously that's not going to work. And that actually happens. So, <laughs> so you know, we have to be super careful about that. Because uh, I personally, like, wouldn't know what type of stain you would need to put on. Right. You would. So I'm just wondering if we have that resource of somebody who could look at these projects and say, yeah, that'll be good. I, I think we do have um, a procedure or a policy and yeah, procedure a policy. just for Silver Box, which I'm going and a, a contract agreement too. Yes. But it's really, I think, on the artist to do the research, right? Yeah. Basically, it is, you know. Yeah. We do explain those advertisers. Uh, you know that it, we put it on Cafe. Cafe. So Cafe is the. Uh, uh, website where you can put your call for art and of course we can make it regional we can make it absolutely local we can make it national if we wanted to and last time city council actually asked us to put the call out nationally as opposed to regionally which is what the commission had uh, thought we would do you know idaho oregon washington Montana, I think is the, mm -hmm. what we had recommended and city council actually came back and said, let's go national. And so- And the why behind that? And the why behind that yeah. is just because there aren't as many uh, public artists locally yet. For outdoor. For outdoors. Like this is uh, it's too cheeky, but the, I have pictures of this. We had a heartbreak moment where actually the heart broke off and was damaged. Yeah. yeah. So although this is metal and welded, unfortunately, it ended up uh, falling over. So oh, yeah. that's the thing we have to look out for. Yeah. So hi, Jennifer. If you'd like to be at the head, we're just yeah. finishing <laughs> talking about the Silver Box program. Right. So um, next steps, we're going to get it um, on the council agenda to be approved to move forward with doing the call to artists and getting it up and running. Then we, once that's approved, then we do the call out to artists through CAFE. It takes about a month. Um, we receive submissions, um, then our commission looks at those submissions and then picks the three. That recommendation goes back to council and then council would approve it. Um, and then from there, once it's approved, we continue the process of working with the artists, getting the agreement set, getting it installed. We work with Parks and Rec to get them installed on the stanchions um, and then we go from there. So, so you're probably be installing them. That would be the hope. Yeah. So if we can have quick turnarounds and everything goes in process. So um, we did present this to Sura. And so Caitlin, I loved your question about funding with public art. And I'm definitely going to talk to that at our next meeting. Um, but this um, project is currently funded by Sandpoint Urban Renewal Agency, Sura. Um, there's a reserved fund right now. The remaining balance is $5,159.78 to continue this, which will be enough to complete this round with um, the siphon of the artists and the uh, cost to use cafe. So um, we're really excited about it. Any other questions to Silver Box? Perfect. Well, we'll keep you posted on that. All right. Well, we're going to jump back to um, new business then. Uh, actually, the City Reader Series 5A. And our speaker today is City Administrator Jennifer Christopher. Thanks, Ellie. Awesome. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm open to any questions that generally the commission may have this morning, but I kind of thought our most relevant activity right now probably to this commission and where you might have questions is um, related to the downtown waterfront design competition. So 
um, want to start with that this morning. Um, we're really kicking that effort off in earnest this week. Uh, we are deadline for submission of proposals from design teams was about a week and a half ago. And we received eight different submissions from design teams that had local representation, were regional, were national, and some international um, presence in those as well. Our jury met uh, about a week ago and reviewed all of those applications and that occurred, our proposals that occurred over a period of about a day and a half. They really deliberated on those and ultimately came to a unanimous uh, decision about the selection of three firms to move to phase two. Um, all three of these firms have representatives who have presence here in Sandpoint or are uh, located, have presence down in Coeur d'Alene, but have done projects specifically here in Sandpoint. So you will see some, some familiar faces with these, with these three different design team groups. So they're all made up of multiple different firms. So all have engineering as a part of their firm all have master planning and specifically downtown master planning is a part of their qualifications and firms that have that experience. Um, some have environmental engineers involved as well. Um, all have involvement with landscape architects, arts and historic preservation. So that is represented on um, all three of the firms. Uh, tomorrow night, is the first opportunity for the community to hear from these firms and their qualifications and a chance to dialogue with them a little bit. That will be here in council chambers from 5.30 to seven. So the format of that is gonna be kind of open house format. It will start with Don Stastny, our competition manager, kind of opening with where we are and what to expect moving forward in the design competition. And then each of the firms will be invited to do a 10 minute presentation about their experience and credentials. So they haven't started anywhere into anything um, relative to our projects here in Sandpoint at this point, um, but this is for you to know who they are and what their experience is. So that'll take about 45 minutes. That will be the first 45 minutes of the meeting. Uh, we will be having it in person here in council chambers. We will be streaming it live as well. So you can watch that and it will be up on our YouTube channel then on, um, then on uh, Thursday. Uh, and following that 45 minutes, the remainder of the 45 minutes, the teams will probably have display boards with information about their firms and projects. And it will be kind of informal open house style where you have the opportunity to actually engage with any of the teams and, and talk with them. So we'll have a couple teams that are set up here in this room or maybe out um, into the overflow and we'll have a third team over in the lobby because I expect we'll get a good turnout for this. So we have to balance our occupancy loads in here. So uh, that is the plan for tomorrow night. What is happening with these teams over the period of the next two days, they are all in town starting at noon tomorrow. And we start our technical briefing with the teams at one o'clock tomorrow afternoon. So um, that is our technical team, primarily day one. That is mayor opening it up. It's going to be Don uh, explaining next steps and expectations about the competition to them. And then it's going to be our technical advisory team here, which are our staff members who are familiar with our conditions downtown as well as all of our master planning efforts in downtown. So infrastructure development services on our transportation plan, our building official on the challenges with building and building code requirements downtown, Amy, our city planner, talking about what our current codes and zoning regulations are in our downtown core. Heather, of course, addressing the arts and culture master plan, historic preservation master plan, the desire for considering a historic district. Um, Maeve nevins Lauter, speak our parks planning and development manager who will be speaking to our parks concepts and visions for what type of stormwater treatment we really want down interfacing 
at the waterfront, innovative treatments, um, not necessarily out of the box thinking. Greg Lanning, our utilities director, addressing utility issues and talking about stormwater challenges throughout our community and particularly in the downtown core. So that kind of gives them the basis of information the afternoon of day one. Then um, we move into with them Thursday. It is an all day briefing. We're gonna to be touring downtown. So you may see us there. We're gonna be talking about projects that we know are um, being contemplated, even those that most of those actually that we don't have applications for. And again, to explain why the design competition now, um, we are in the process of finalizing our comprehensive plan and updates. And when that is done, we move into uh, code modifications after that, which generally takes quite a bit of time, um, particularly because the comp plan and when we get into code changes, we're looking at words on paper. And for the public to really engage in what that's gonna look like, what that's gonna feel like and really help them engage in that process and move along, that's one of the things we accomplished with a design competition where there's visuals and there's things for people to really react to, which typically isn't a part of, again, a comp plan update or a code update process. The reason again for a competition approach, as opposed to just selecting um, an individual uh, team who may have submitted a proposal is this gives us the opportunity as we move throughout this process and we have additional public input opportunities um, and were the juries taking a look at these in response to what we're hearing from the public, looking at efficacy of solutions, viability of those costs associated with those is with three teams moving at the same time, what we might find is we like an element that one team presented, but we really overall like the concept from another team. And this gives us a chance to have a dialogue with the teams saying before we get to the final team, saying we like what you did here, but we would like you to incorporate these types of concepts, this type of thinking. And so it really gives us broader thinking and proposals than what we would typically do through a standard procurement process with this. Um, also, hopefully it moves us further along with visuals um, and a team really analyzing what's across all of our plan it plans in looking at how do we thread all of these things together and do it simultaneously. And there's gonna be elements of plans, try as hard as we might, that are gonna be conflicting. So um, they might propose a way forward um, addressing a priority in one plan that another plan maybe doesn't have a priority or has taken a different approach. So it's really weaving together our master plans with this, and it will be a high priority uh, with these teams and emphasizing again, the importance of arts and culture to the character of our community um, as an element of our downtown and what type of businesses and a flourishing arts and culture scene that we want in our downtown, as well as giving them the challenge on the historic preservation and the historic district. We've had a lot of conversations about that over the years, but they have never gone so far as to defining a where and more specifics of the what uh, with that. So this will be three different teams looking at that and presenting. Maybe we come out with very similar approaches across all three, or maybe we see uh, differences in that and it's an opportunity to engage in a dialogue about why the differences. And again, ultimately we can get move for, moving forward with it. Um, we do have projects in the pipeline. We do not have applications right now for a number of the projects that um, property owners, developers are considering downtown. So we don't have anything to release publicly on it. Um, but we have several of those property owners, developers engaged in this process for the standpoint of trying to influence what their project is, because we have many projects that you're seeing today. You've seen the visuals for Bridge and First, 
Um, people have seen other visuals for downtown that for the most part, they're in compliance with our current city code. So we don't have a basis to say, you can't build what you're proposing to build the way that it is. All of these property owners, developers have agreed to engage in this process, be influenced with this process. We have several who we are hearing from that actually, they aren't really necessarily happy with the full outcome of their projects. So hopefully this influences them and their design teams to think a little bit differently as well. So that's the reason for moving this ahead now. Um, because if we wait or if we go through our standard process with the comp plan update and code changes, the development's going to happen and we're going to be chasing what may happen in another five to 10 years, not what potentially is happening in the next six to 60 months. Um, so that's the reason for moving this forward, um, the way that we're moving it forward. And um, I think you'll be really happy with the teams that we have as a part of this. As Don told the technical or the jurors when they were reviewing these, we had such excellent proposals that there really was no wrong choice. When they got down to finalists, it really was a difficult choice. And um, day two uh, debate with the jurors was really around getting the top five to three. Uh, and so that was probably four hours of debate um, with the jurors going back and forth uh, with all of those. So uh, that's where we are with the design competition and I'm happy to answer any questions about it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot <laughs> and it's gonna be a long week this week, but I again, I think this is gonna get us to the vision we've been talking about downtown while we've had streets plans, while we've had economic studies, while we've considered street reversions, we have done uh, street improvements, we've done some stormwater improvements. None of those ever efforts have ever been completely consolidated into a master plan for downtown. And the benefit of having that master plan is it really influences again what development you see in your downtown. It also supports what type of businesses can make it in our downtown. Do we want in our downtown that would support a thriving downtown? Uh, and uh, it gives predictability for those of you who are down there too and what you can expect moving forward. So um, that's the intent with that. Simultaneously with this, we are working on the downtown parking lot and are in the midst of feasibility on what that's going to look like to um, add additional parking structure, additional parking spots, and um, is it feasible for a public-private partnership? Well, it's my presentation below the number speaker, just a couple of minutes. We haven't gotten the final confirmations, but I think what you'll most likely see is two or three from each of the teams. Um, they're all regional uh, in nature. So I would say we have representation from Boise, from Sandpoint, from Coeur d'Alene, from Portland, from Spokane. Uh, so they may not send all of their team members in because most are running teams of about six to 10. Um, so they may, I would not suspect that they will fly in all their team members, but I think you'll see probably the team leads. And again, those that are the familiar faces, that's who I think you'll see tomorrow. And Jennifer, could you explain the jury and how they're really technical individuals that are kind of the filters because they are experts on this? I think that would be helpful to everybody. Sure. So there was much controversy about um, choosing of our jurors and should they all be local? Um, and should we have representation from outside the community and why these specific jurors um, ultimately were selected? So our jury is um, six, I think six members, um, maybe seven. We Half of them are local and half of them are from outside of the area, but outside of the area, 
regional outside of the area. We have um, one jury member who is um, from, works in uh, Clarkston, he's uh, in Lapway and um, is a civil engineer and has a ton of experience, um, particularly with um, government projects, civil engineering projects and um, tribal engineering projects. So he is a tribal member himself and um, specializes in a lot of the work with um, the different tribes throughout Idaho, particularly. Uh, we have landscape architects um, we have experience with um, construction managers. We have a woman who's been very involved in arts and culture and events and development of that particular scene in Portland. And the mix with the jury was really looking for those technical experts. They are not, the jury's intent is not to necessarily represent the community. They are to hear back the feedback as we start doing, um, start sharing out uh, proposals and concepts for the community. All of the community input will come back to the jury. But what the jury brings to the table outside of our local participants, although they've got expertise too, but particularly with those outside of our area is that technical expertise that when we're looking down at Farman's Landing, for example, and we're looking at considering stormwater treatment solutions down there, what are those costs? How viable are those? Are they working well in other communities? Is this innovative and cutting edge or is this a standard that they're implementing in other communities? Based on those that are implemented, what type of treatment can we expect? from a stormwater system like that. So it's that technical expertise on things uh, that they bring. I think we're also looking, one of the challenges for the teams is as they develop these concepts, they are supposed to give us costing for those. And they are supposed to also recommend a phasing plan because as you know, it's very popular with us at the city to phase projects because we've got to spread uh, funds over multiple years. And so recommendations on that, but I think you'll see what we're going to be adding on the technical side of the competition is probably an outside estimator who's going to take a look at all of their cost estimates and validate all of those because we get them all the time um, in our different projects at the city and sometimes they're good and many times they have proved not necessarily to be so good. So. I think we're going to bring in an outside to um, individual to vet those as well. So the jurors are really technical experts. And again, it's not to represent what the community wants or decide what the community wants other than hearing the feedback from the community itself. What they are is technical experts. And that is a needed component with this because we as a community could see a concept in there for City Beach, for example, an improved concept, and we may love it, but the viability of building it, the cost of building it is not feasible. Uh, and you'll recall that when we were working on our parks concepts, um, particularly City Beach, I think I'll stay with that one and pick on it. Um, there was a lot of consternation and concern by members of the community whether that realigned boat launch was actually viable, how much dredging would be required. Is that really a viable boat launch? That's the reason for having a juror, a, a technical expertise to review that and really weigh in on the viability, ask those questions and test that. Um, so we're ensuring that that is occurring simultaneous with our community process. A lot of people have been asking me when public input um, will be included in, uh, I have the schedule up here and um, I think we've done a, a really great job of highlighting the different areas, but uh, do you have any comments to that and how public input will be processed? Uh, what I can say is that on those June dates, those early June dates, when we are at presentations to the community, our intent is that is going to happen two ways. They're going to have to create boards 
which are gonna be available in the community like we're typically doing when we're doing our planning and our concept development at the city. The community will have the opportunity with that to provide written feedback, which will ultimately go to the jury again, making sure the community is heard. But in addition to that, those will be electronic as well. So we will have those concepts posted online. So like everything we do here, it gives the opportunity for people to participate in person virtually or both, because sometimes when something is thrown at you in a night when we're doing an open house or a workshop on something at the time, you may have one reaction to it, but it's overnight and into the next week, 10 other questions and issues come up with it. So that will be the reason that we're doing both of those in person as well as online. So this will not, this is not the only opportunity to uh, hear from these teams tomorrow night is the opportunity to really kick off that public process and really meet them and hear who they are. And you may have a team you think is gonna be best and we'll see how it plays <laughs> out. <laughs> so we are um, helping promote or bring people in tomorrow night. That's kind of what I'm hearing is the most important thing is this is not where they're presenting their ideas. This Correct. is where they're presenting who they are and their expertise that they could bring to this project. Right. Okay. And you're gonna, again, you're gonna see some who have ideas and it will be interesting as we move throughout this process. Um, what do they do with a broader team in um, revisiting their ideas? So I'll give you an example. Um, Bernardo Wills is on one of our teams and they developed all of our parks concepts as part of our parks and recreation master plan. We've already gotten feedback from the public on some of those concepts about things we'd like to see changed and things happen have happened in the community since that time, which is why when we are going through uh, our process of project development, we have a concept which we call in here, we like to call them cartoons because they aren't fully fleshed out, they aren't engineered, um, we might have very high level costs with those, but we aren't down into construction documents. And one of the challenges that we have and where we're debating what we do with our concepts moving forward is when you put out a picture, a picture is worth a million words and, and we have found uh, that people really get hung up on what that cartoon or concept is. And we saw this play out with downtown street construction. So we had a concept that had I don't know, 30 trees in downtown. When it came down to the constructability and they were into design for construction, by the time they're layering in all of our underground utilities, all of the ramps that are needed downtown for accessibility, the stormwater treatment, we ended up with something less, 27 trees. And one of the debates that we had as this was coming out in the community was, um, we were told 30 trees, we were getting 30 trees, but we're at concept phase and now into construction phase. So sometimes that plays out where our concepts fully flesh out and are built out um, exactly as they're portrayed more often than not. You will see some tweaks and revetting because we haven't gotten to that next level of construction documents. And then in like our typical process, there's community input and workshops when we're in the conceptual design. It comes back and there's community input and process when we are actually in construction, further vetting our concept design because those changes are occurring and we want the community to see them. And also things may have changed from original concepts. So couple examples off the top of my head. I know we have for downtown right now with the adopted concepts. Um, he showed a regional playground down at City Beach as part of the concept and a splash pad. We have heard from the community from the time we've adopted that plan. They're not interested in a splash pad down at City Beach where the public really wanted the splash pad was in a more quiet park that didn't have access to the water. So the splash pad is now over in Traverse Park as a part of that revitalization of that playground, rebuilding that playground with a combination playground and splash pad. So 
that will and we'll be advising the teams community does not want a splash pad down in city beach we heard from the community about the concerns relative to green space as well as um, as uh, parking well that's that's going to have to be one of these things i think with the master planning they're going to have to vet out with that and um, there's parking available at the city parking lot that people like to park most conveniently at the beach. How do we reconcile this and what does a master plan really support and again what does the community support so those kinds of things I think you'll see um, come out with that. Um, I suspect there's going to be much debate when we get down on the waterfront again our adopted concept down at city beach um, shows an events venue down at city beach some like that some feel strongly they don't want to have that there i suspect that will be a community discussion again as this moves forward um, one of the challenges i know we will be giving them on special events is our special events downtown um, farmers market for example at farm and park and getting into jeff jones square the space just isn't sufficient any longer um, Farmers Market has come to us and said that. Uh, on the other side, we deal with it from a parks maintenance standpoint in that we can never get that grass restored in that park back in line because we're dealing with Farmers Market there every single weekend. So um, we've got some maintenance challenges with that park too. So with master planning in downtown and thinking about your arts, culture, historic preservation master plan, that vibrancy, that arts and culture aspect um, to our downtown, contributing to the economic vitality of the downtown is important. Um, but moving forward, um, how should we handle that and where and what? So where should POAC be? We moved and it's been successful down on Main Street, but should we do something different with Main Street that that's more of a, uh, um, more of an event location than just a street that we stick events on. Um, should the city look at acquiring additional property for events? Should all of our events be in our downtown? Should there be criteria for our events downtown? That's the type of thing in the master planning I think you can expect. Interesting. Oh, very exciting. I know. <laughs> they are, it, it is going to be complicated and uh, they're going to have a ton of challenges so i expect what we'll see is some teams where they have strengths may go further in one area than another team so we might see one team their strength and what they really gravitate towards is those concepts down on the waterfront another team might be all about the master planning in downtown and thinking about that and again that ability to pull across teams and consolidate this is the benefit so in essence what we really have is probably 20 different firms um, tackling our myriad of challenges downtown and we're going to be able to sort through all those different things correctly that there is a master plan in place for a public transportation emerging uh spot has a plan um, for public transportation, but at this point that is, and then we have the city's multimodal plan, um, which really, yeah, which really references over to um, the spot plan in terms of um, their transportation, if you think about uh, the buses, shuttles, those kinds of things. But again, I think that will be something for this group to consider. It would be interesting to know how they interact with downtown development, uh, public transportation and spot. They are relevant when uh, parking spaces are assigned. Exactly, yeah. 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 Let's bring back the inner urban railway. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions about city process, arts, culture, ordinances? Thank you for your detail. Uh, I feel like every time there's a question, you answer it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Heather's going to be keeping you engaged and updated in this, and your presence at the meetings, your input is going to be really critical um, because it again it is weaving all these master plans together, and you've got other things you're doing that don't necessarily uh, relate to this particular effort, but you have a lot of components in your master plan that does so. 
how do we get all of those things to speak together, your goals and objectives combined with our multimodal transportation challenges and plans in those areas. And we may again see concepts that come back and, um, and uh, inform our, our plans when we're doing things differently, maybe not necessarily on the arts and culture side, maybe on the transportation side. Um, so we could see a variety of things. I think the key to this, Don, if you follow this, then Ellie, I know you've been at all the meetings. Um, he tells the council over and over again, trust the process. So, and I think that's what we're struggling with this a little bit is this isn't super well defined by design. Right. Um, it's handing them the challenge because we have not had all of the answers. So it's for them to give us something to react to. And so far, um, what I have seen in working through this with um, the jurors, now trying to work with developers, property owners, and get them engaged in this, is um, we're kind of settling down a little bit. And I think you're going to find this is a great process. We are so fortunate as a community to have Don leading this effort here. And I don't know if all of you have looked in his background, but legitimately the worldwide expert on leading design competitions, on innovative, um, but respectful, informed by history, um, dating back generations and um, thinking about um, our indigenous populations and that history and how we incorporate that into what we're doing today and do it respectfully. Don is the worldwide expert on that. He has literally touched all of the major projects in cities across this country and um, all across the world. Uh, he was intimately involved when Portland kind of emerged as a city center and had all of their arts and culture and historic elements, the Pearl District, the development of their farmer's market, all of that in their downtown core, that was Don at the center of all of that, um, that led the team that was working on those efforts. And I know we don't wanna feel or look like Portland, but you look at his experiences other places, it's that he has that level of experience and knowledge to be able to really hear this community and oversee a process that is going to fit our community. That's not a picking up Portland and putting it in our community or anywhere else. Even last week when I was talking with him, he's just casually um, mentioning to me um, how he was working with Jen Manhard works with him on projects. So he was telling me the background and the history of working with her. So Jen was um, is also a master planner, as is Don. And then Don is also um, an architect. He is in the Fellowship for Architects Society. He is, he is one of the renowned architects in this country. And when Jen was at a planning firm, large planning firm, they were involved when Abu Dhabi was developing as a city and what the visions were there. And the first consultant they brought in was Don to work on those projects. So I, he's done most of the US uh, embassies across the world, led design competitions for those. When COVID hit, he was actually working on the US embassy in China. He is fascinating. His work here, a lot of his work is down in the National Mall in Washington, DC. Uh, he has done waterfront projects like what we have here in this community, but that knowledge of um, how you lead an effort like this and how you put this whole thing together and solve a puzzle like this, he is the master at that. And we are so fortunate because he isn't actively doing projects anymore. It has to be a community that he has absolutely bought into um, that inspires him and uh, that is a project that he feels he can really make a difference in. So that's how we got him here in Sandpoint. It's not to make Sandpoint a something else. It's to make Sandpoint Sandpoint. But in this time when we're seeing all of these factors across the world and in our economy, um, 
in our country, we're seeing closing of retail stores. We're seeing downtowns dying in larger communities. I mean, Don really sees that as a puzzle. And I think that's how he approaches standpoint is there really is something special here. And how is this a model and how do we think about all these dynamics that are occurring across our country right now, economically and everywhere else? Um, and how do you have a thriving downtown with all of that happening? And that's his approach to our project here in Sandpoint. Maybe I missed it, but you talked about the external jury members. What was the internal uh, jury members from from both the, I guess, the city and how are you representing the public at, at large of the town in this jury? Good question. Uh, so the mayors um, on the jury as our chief elected official um, elected by the community to re represent um, the community and the city specifically. Uh, Katie Cox from Kinnicksu Land Trust is on the jury. So Katie by training is an architect. Uh, she's also heavily involved in the recreation communities is um, very involved in environmental issues as well. So she brings an aspect of the community that way that has great concerns about all of those elements. But then again, that professional expertise as an architect um, where um, she can really assess viability of projects as well. Um, Rob Talbot is on the jury, so he's operating Heartwood Center, um, small business owner, um, entrepreneur, uh, so he kind of represents that small business entrepreneurial spirit that is much a part of our community and thinking and bringing in some of the challenges for um, an arts and culture perspective, how you, how you run a business, how you compete in a small economy here with other businesses, how you're complementary to other businesses, and then is using both indoor facilities, programming and private um, establishments, as well as in the parks. So um, uh, Rob brings that. And then finally, a jury member that many of you may not know, um, but if you have the chance, and I suspect we'll see him at the open house, it's a fascinating conversation to talk with him. Um, Steve from um, DEQ. I can't remember his Gil. name. Yes. Steve Gill. Um, Steve Gill. I'm sorry. I don't know where that went this morning. Much. A lot. Uh, Steve Gill is um, arguably, if you trace back to original families that were here in Sandpoint, his is one of them. Um, his family op uh, operated several businesses and Steve was involved in those businesses in downtown. So specifically when we get looking at areas like Bridge and First, um, his family uh, operated a gas station over in that area. He knows an awful lot about what's happened, the culture of our community, historically the culture of our community today um, and so he worked in the business for his parents up until I think it was about his mid 20s. And then he decided that he wanted to pursue higher education. So went to University of Idaho, got his um, degree in um, environmental issues and has worked for DEQ specifically in Brownfields programs um, throughout his career, his career is sunsetting, and he sees the opportunity to participate in this project as a way to really get back to the community that he's from, influence, um, and again, assess what our downtown is moving forward, very much informed by the history of the past. For us at the city, when we're doing projects throughout town, particularly downtown, and we're going to be digging up things when we did our downtown revitalization phase one and phase two, we call Steve um, because our internal joke here is he knows where all the dead bodies are buried. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> he knows where we will find tanks underground mm -hmm. and what was done to mitigate it and where there are issues. I mean, he's got all of that historical knowledge. So 
um, while there was some questions when it came to counsel and people don't see him in the community as much because he's in his professional capacity with DEQ. Steve is very much a native Sandpointian and um, has that history and knowledge and literally can take his family back here to the beginning of um, the last century and trace his family roots. So they were original homestead family here in Sandpoint. So he kind of, again, professional technical hat, but then really knowing this community and being able to represent. And he's also tied to funding sources. So that never hurts. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Jennifer? I know, Heather, you know this, but I just want you to know, Jennifer, that the museum is available as a resource for any of the team members for any historical information that would help them through this process. Um, we're excited to be a part of this. And see where it goes. Great. And I suspect that will happen. So I'm glad you brought that up because I want to address something else, too. Um, because you are on Arts, Culture, Historic Preservation Commission, um, Teams get to be really sneaky when we're doing procurement and we're used to it here in the city. We'll have a procurement out where we're looking for somebody to provide some services to us. And then all of a sudden, May, for example, we'll get a call, we're a new landscape firm in town and we'd love to meet with you. But really what they're trying to do is compete in this procurement. They're smart because they're trying to get other information, but Think about this process. It's a procurement process, right? We haven't selected our final team. This is a process to get to our final vision as the community and select the right team that probably is going to be working with us to further work on that moving forward. So if team members call you, um, want to talk with you about issues as a commission member, you need to direct them back to the competition manager. It does not mean you will not be involved and we will not be reaching out to you because I suspect they are going to have a number of questions. And so um, we may need information from the museum. We may be sending people to the museum. We may want to be um, digging further into, again, what is the vision in the future for the music conservatory. But think about this is they're competing. So we can't give one team an advantage over another team. Okay. That's the way to think about it. That's good to know. So any of their needs would be pulled through the city, not directly from that. Yeah. Contact yeah, me and then I can get it to the right individual. But what you did with the um, Kalispell and Kootenai information, putting it on your website in a link form that's public to everybody, that was amazing. Okay. So that that And now they're getting well. those resources. So they have some briefing papers from us already. And as we move through the process, there may be other things. We might say, could we get your plans for a music conservatory that we could share with them? But then you'll know that request will come from us and it will be in their briefing papers. So every team is on an equal playing field. is, And that's gonna be one of our challenges through this. So for tomorrow night's <laughs> meeting, um, we have done public notice because we're certainly helpful we have at least a quorum, if not all of you there. Um, we expect a quorum, if not all of our planning and zoning commissioners, as well as the council. So it is noticed as a public meeting where no decisions are being made, um, but it is a public meeting because we expect quorums to be there. So, and uh, they will pick information, look for every advantage because <laughs> this is work for them in the future, so. And I love that one line for the purposes of this design competition. That's that's a great way to say it and then <clears throat> lead them back to, I'm gonna have you contact blah, blah, blah. They'll be able to answer further questions for you. I thought that that line was brilliant from Dawn. And some you will know. So <laughs> many of you, I'll just call out one. So. Most of us in this community know Ryan Lutman. He's in Rotary. He's very involved in this community. He is on a team. So while we are in this process and when you are interacting with Ryan Lutman and suddenly talking about arts and culture or historic preservation, Ryan is on a competing team. So you've got to start to think you're going to get a little taste of what our life can be like here. So. <laughs>
you know, anything else, it's not a problem to talk with team members. And obviously you've got relationships with some of these individuals and we do too. Um, but it's when it starts varying into the design competition and I'm not calling out Ryan in particular, they all do it, they all do it. So, because they wanna do a good job for the community. Absolutely. All right. Um, one more comment. Yeah, um, I wanna thank you for supporting Heather and this group for the work that you're, you're allowing us to do to be prepared to be proactive at the end of this design competition instead of reactive at the end of it. And I just want to tell you thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. Well, my hope is that this gets you to the point where we're moving stuff forward quickly because I know it's been a frustration for you and others on the commission, whether current in the past, that things just aren't moving fast enough, particularly when we get talking about a historic district. So um, I'm hoping this is your means to get things moving. And our staff plan is um, get this done, get comp plan and get working on code. So thank you. I appreciate that, Woody. And actually I was gonna say the same thing. I appreciate you so much for everything you've done for the past art commission for this one. And going forward, it's really great to be getting stuff done um, on the master plan and moving forward in this exciting time. Thank you. Thank you. We are looking at a new urban renewal district. Um, the benefit to this uh, commission, again, is through this process with our urban renewal district, it might be stable funding extending out more years um, for this commission as well. Yeah. Would that be a tip district? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have one downtown already. Right. Um, and then we have one on the north side. But if you actually look in our, um, you look at the current outline for our urban renewal district, tip district downtown, um, there aren't actually that many properties that are in it. Basically, the revenue generators for it are the Cachapa building that was renovated the um, Columbia Bank Building Sandpoint Center in uh, downtown, and a tiny bit at the Granary and Seasons. Um, I was surprised when I read that. Yeah. It's only those two properties. So we see redevelopment at our two infamous holes in the ground. Those aren't contrib contributing to, they wouldn't be contributing to the 1% for um, arts and culture, historic preservation, um, and they would not be contributing to our waterfront improvement projects. That's one of the reasons we're looking at um, a new urban renewal district. Uh, the hotel, there are plans, uh, new owners for the Edgewater Hotel down at City Beach. They are planning on taking that down and doing a rebuild um, in about a year and a half. And that is not in the urban renewal district. And so one of the questions came up relative to downtown, you know, we're in millions of dollars of projects, just our waterfront. How are we gonna fund those? Um, the answer is to do it through urban renewal. That's the intention. It doesn't raise anybody's tax rates. They're paying the same amount of taxes that it pools it across the taxing district for those um, public improvements that encourage further investment and the type of investment and development we want in downtown. So um, we have our numbers already as to what that kind of looks like. And you'll probably see that move through our process and ultimately to council by the end of this year. Is that a, a move that needs to be taken by the public or can that be done by ordinance? By ordinance, it'll be a public hearing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Thank you all, and thank you for the work that that you all are doing. So I'm glad to see silver boxes coming back, and hopefully we have more sustainable art on our boxes <laughs> because that's been a challenge for us a bit. But uh, thank you for the work on on that, and all of you individually, especially those that are involved in organizations, because I really appreciate the culture that you bring to the community. I personally enjoy it um, as a community member. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Jennifer. I appreciate the time that you gave to our commission today. I know how busy you are, but every time I get to sit down with you, I learn so much and I'm inspired and I feel like we all kind of 
felt that way today. So we so appreciate Thank you. you. There's a lot going on at this yes. little city. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And if you ever have any questions or concerns, um, don't hesitate to reach out to me anytime. Um, I will be the first to admit I can be very difficult to get a hold of during the day because I'm running from meeting to meeting. But I do have an assistant, Cassidy, who's wonderful if you haven't met her yet. Um, and she answers my phone all day. She manages my calendar. She can get people on my calendar. Um, if you are looking for me late in the day, I'm usually here till at least six, most days seven. So getting me late in the day is when I'm out of meetings and available at City Hall. And I know it's your personal time, but if on your personal time you want something here at the city, I am more than happy to take calls and do meetings early or late. Wonderful. Thank, thank you so you. much. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Okay, well, that was amazing. amazing. I'm so excited for tomorrow. <laughs> It'll be great. <laughs> thank all right. you all. Bye bye. Yeah. All right. Um, let's go ahead and go into new business. Uh, 7A Public Art Understanding. Yes. Public art projects team. Oh. Okay. I think you're right, though. Oh. Yeah, but we kind of meshed it. But is there anything that we should add? We are feverishly working. <laughs> and bless everybody. Like, I'm such an idea generator. So every meeting I come with a new exciting idea of how we can use history to do great things with great projects. But well, the one thing we might mention yeah. is the, the, the Colorado City Love Land. Love yes. Land. Yes. And did you want to speak? I love what you were saying about creative vitality within the heart of our downtown. If you listen to that, you know, what was missing it was just that uh, Loveland has a beautiful national historic district, you know, you know very similar in a lot of ways to what we have here. But Colorado, uh, Colorado also has a, uh, a program where they call creative district, creative arts district. And it's actually a statutory program on the state legislature. And um, you go through a process and right now there's 27 creative arts districts in Colorado. And, and generally they overlay in a very uh, uh, synergistic way with the um, uh, historic districts. You know, and so they kind of play together a lot. And, so, and, and I was just, just mentioning that, that you know how how that works and seems to be a very successful uh, formula or like what jennifer was saying is how do you in the new internet world where there's so many things being bought over the world wide web and downtown business is closing and stuff how do you keep a uh, an energetic downtown business um, environment there and one of the ways that they seem to be able to do that is by having the sense of the creative district in there that that generates the coffee shops that generates the you know not that we have a shortage of coffee shops <laughs> but, but it generates the sense of of people and people want to be there and that's what you have to have you have to have people in the environment for it to be successful and the, the Loveland has just a great website with lots of resources for their historic preservation in particular. So I, I thought it was a great thing if you have time to go on there and just take a little peek. Um, their programming was incredible. Their programming was really great. So, you know, it might be something to um, look at and take some tidbits from uh, as far as presenting to the community. They have, I was telling me that she can lead our bike tour because yeah, she's such a bike yeah. enthusiast. Enthusiast. I was like, I would end up like biking into a sign while I'm talking. <laughs> but um, when I went on their site and I discovered them through understanding historic brick, um, 
I fell down this rabbit hole and I, I almost spent about a day <laughs> and I was completely inspired. And I think a lot of what we're going to be doing is looking at what other cities have done and how do we incorporate that into a larger plan as we start getting things rolling. <laughs> this is our walking tour though. And just an example, um, we're constantly merging history and art together and culture with the combination of our group. And what's great about all of you is that you're you're either part of the fabric of the culture. Well, you, you all are part of the fabric of the culture, but also maybe historically, maybe you grew up here. Um, you're into arts and you're also into historic preservation. And so I love how we all have those lenses. Um, so thinking about that, um, I was inspired to inject art into our historic preservation walking tour map. I think, again, it, that's a great example of how do we merge all these things Let's add some more graphic art to it. Let's have um, performance theater artists lead the tour. And so we're working on um, taking the foundation, which we have that is really good, but we're gonna bring it to that next level by interjecting either art or history. Um, so that those are conversations that we have been having in our meetings. Um, and that's why I'd like to think of our historic preservation meetings a little bit broader and not just focus on historic preservation, but focus on culture and art as well. Um, and any of you that can join us, it'd be amazing. We generally meet once a week to create momentum on Mondays at nine o'clock. Um, and it, usually they're about an hour, um, but they've been super effective. Um, what we're going to be doing is moving forward into a work plan um, for three main uh, categories, and I can send that out to all of you. Um, so we're going to take a little pause because there's so much going on within the city um, uh, for the next couple of uh, meetings, and then we're, we're going to do homework during that period of time and then come back. Um, so it's, it's exciting, um, but yeah, very efficient and a very fun time. And I won't say there's coffee. <laughs> no. Yeah, so I think like you, when you were at the oral history with Carol, you can talk about the history with Arts Alliance being there, right? Right, so originally uh, the Arts Alliance was where uh, Serena Cycles is and Steve Holt came and, and we talked about uh, you know, calling it the Granary Art District. We, we thought we would have more, more art uh, organizations in that district. Well, it turns out that, you know, kind of things have gone a little bit different way there. So uh, when we determined that designation, it was never, it was all in name only. So now it's kind of dropped to Granary District since the Heartwood is really the only artsy programming there, but that's okay. You know, it's like everything else in Sandpoint, we ebb and flow and change. So, um, you know, that just gives more weight to expanding the historical district down, down and probably calling some section of downtown the art district as well. Yeah, Mike's gonna have to jump off to another meeting, but, um, Thank you for bringing that up. Um, and I was trying to pull it up, but I can send it to you all. I'm working on the comprehensive plan right now, evaluating, um, I'm doing my reviews for it. And I'm definitely incorporating all of you where it makes sense. Um, but we, we are kind of taking like, as Ellie is saying the word arts out. And what we're really seeing is it's more of like a creative maker's space moment. Mm -hmm. And it kind of has its own identity over there. And so when I'm talking to the design teams, I am addressing that. And, and you look at it from a historical standpoint too with its materials, which is completely different than what we want to see downtown too. So from a design standpoint, from a, a creative hub, it is a very unique area. So I will talk to that. But then we are seeing this incredible emergence of arts and culture downtown. Um, Karen, you've been working really hard on that. And so we have our, our amazing arts anchors, our nonprofit organizations and for-profit are downtown in historic buildings and the magic right there on First and Second Street with the Music Conservatory in Canada and POAC being down there and maybe even the museum, who knows what your future is, <laughs> being downtown 
it's happening. We have, you know, a potential children's museum down there with creations. Like it's the beauty and, um, and the blooming of that seed is developing there. And so that's kind of, those are the two and they and truly have two different identities too. Um, but the co-op um, district, that granary district is individually registered on the national register. So that one is, but I think there's a lot of confusion. It's not a designated district. That was the hope in the future, but I think we're seeing change now. Yeah. Absolutely. Nope. And I can share anything with you that that may be. Thank you all for your time too. So I, I think if we move to 7A, we should move that to our next meeting. Okay. It was more of like a tickler of all the public art possibilities. <laughs> um, and my vision for the next meeting would be to talk about public art process, SURA, funding, all the, the details of that. I, and um, if she can, I think it'd be wonderful to have our um, Amanda Wilson, who oh. does development in our city, come and speak to us about SURA. She's an expert um, and I love hearing her present as well. Um, so not to take over 7A, but is that okay if we? Yeah, I think it's okay if we move 7A next, uh, next month. So I'm gonna, I'll just kind of drive through these pretty quickly. All right, so I'm going to do this next time. Okay. Ooh. I'd like to point out what you may be in the community we are not aware of. That's brilliant. Okay, we'll put you on there, Karen. All right. Do you want to hop on to city events then? So Let's do that. Uh, okay. Sorry. This black is really tripping me. <laughs> I'm trying to find everything. So I'm still screen sharing. I'm going to go. So we have our Stephen Lyman event. It's still happening. Things are moving along. It's going to be in June. He They've sent us the poster. So I'll keep you apprised of that. Um, but it's June 3rd and it's going to be at the U of I property, as you all know. Um, and it will be free to the public. It's Friday, excuse me, it's Friday, June 2nd from 9 to 10 p.m. Um, we've never had a 10 p.m. art event. <laughs> I think this will be really neat to see how these times go. And then Saturday, June 3rd from 9 to 10, this will be in our Parks and Rec um, brochure. And um, I'll be sending you guys flyers to be for you all to be able to circulate too. Um, so that was one event. Um, we, I'm going to kind of, I, because I'm starting with Stephen Lyman in June, I'm going to talk about June and then go to a more current event. Um, the other thing that's happening on June 3rd is Arbor Day, which is really exciting. And um, we're all about the partnerships. So we're going to be partnering with KNPS. They'll be having their native plants all during that time. Um, we're partnering with the museum. They'll have all their exhibits open and we'll be doing fun activities. Um, Hannah can talk about it coming up, but they, uh, this was a project I worked on back in the day, but a Young Explorers Backpack Program. It's a way for children to engage with the museum and through their, a different um, interactive way. That program will be up and running, which was very exciting. Um, and we'll be working with all the other um, organizations for Arbor Day um, Lions Club. There'll be like a kid's craft. We'll have hopefully landscape designers there, ecologists. Um, so it should be a really fun time. So I'll um, certainly send you more information as that is um, coming to head. And we're so thankful Cammie's leading the event on that one. <laughs> She's amazing. Um, and then April 22nd is um, a community cleanup day. And um, so if that's something you'd like to be a part of, let me know. I can, as soon as I get more information on that event, I'll circulate it to all of you. Um, but it will be just a wonderful time to get together and do something great for our city. Um, one thing that Ellie and I have been talking about is what a public art needs to be maintained right now. And is that a project that volunteers could do? So we're wrapping our mind around that currently, if, if there could be synergy there. So that's, um, a lot going on and a lot of exciting stuff. Um, and the, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about this as an event. Um, it's also a public art project team too, but Keely and I met to go over the walking tour brochure. And um, 
our great vision is to have um, four of your performance community individuals be educated on and, and learn how to do a walking tour. And then maybe four within our commission to um, be trained on how to do a walking tour too. Um, and that way we have eight and above people that can do the tours. Um, and I'm always open to doing pop-up tours if there's a special um, event coming into town of 200 people. So I think we need to understand different opportunities where we can put one together um, fairly quickly because we'll all be trained and we'll all like have it plug and play. And then the second aspect to that would be the coming up with a different name because it's already used, but like some sort of showstopper tour where we have our amazing theatrical team to lead the tours. We're playing around with the idea of the um, last Friday of the month, time to be determined. Um, so we have enough information to be able to put that in the Parks and Rec brochure. And that will be happening um, in June, July, August, and September. Um, and if it's super successful, we can always put more in there too, um, but we're really excited about it. And I talked to Hannah, they're also doing tours, but I love what they're doing with their tours. They're gonna be doing more of experiences and moments that happened throughout the community. And then also they're playing around with the idea of um, the unique animals um, throughout the community for children's tours. So all of our tours are really in alignment. And I love that we can all kind of meet at the same place. And Keely, you mentioned something that I thought was really powerful. We have to train the community to know things. Yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna train them to understand um, and get that routine and habit of where tours are, what they're doing and, and working with um, your organization and the museum and, and the music conservatory and all these other things, pull these tours together. Again, it's all these collaborations to make a, a wonderful educational effect. Oh, and way fun. I love it. So, so that's highlights of all of that. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions on, on the tours? All right. Well, let's head up to uh, 7C, the artist directory. Okay. So Thinking about public art, and as you guys all kind of probably understand for what Jennifer was saying, we have our public art programming going on, um, but, and we have our signature events that we're fleshing out, which right now is a feature thing would be the tours. Um, in terms of big public art projects, that's something um, certainly we want to understand um, more directional from the downtown waterfront. Um, competition. We'll get into that a little bit more next meeting. Um, but one thing um, I, in terms of supporting art in our community, I actually have two, 7C and 7D, that we can start working on now um, would be these things. So um, the first one, I was inspired by what um, Megan Sherry, who historically was a part of the Sandpoint Arts Commission, she has done um, being the art director in the city of Moscow. Um, this is an artist directory that she put, they have for it uh, right on the city website. And it blew my mind. Um, I'm just gonna click on one of them and you okay. can, oh, excuse me. <laughs> so my son is in college at, at U of I and uh, knowing that Megan is the art director, I said, you need to talk to Megan. And first up, she's got this artist directory. So John is on, has his photography on. This is Ellie Simon. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? So, so powerful. The great thing about this is it's encompassing of all artists then in the community. It's There's no, um, if you want to sign up for it, you can. You don't have to be a member of anything. It's just a way to, be seen on the art programming in Moscow. It's certainly an amazing way to build capacity for local artists. And, and again, it, their personal information is on here. So we're just becoming a connector. So we're, we're not, the only way we're, we're connecting someone that is looking for an artist, they can go to this website, um, but we're not facilitating transactions or anything like that, which I think is brilliant. Um, if you're an artist and you're looking at moving here, 
I think this is a wonderful way to understand the local art community and feel like, hey, you fit in. And I love how it's just a curated page of all of our artists as well. Um, so what do you guys think about this? Do you like? My question this? is, yeah. would, it be a, would, it be, would it be wise of us to collaborate with POAC on this? Because I feel like they already have a really set in stone stable of artists that they feature a lot of. And I feel like they would be our subject matter experts for this. Yes, I love that. I did sit down with Tone and and Carol at a different meeting too and I I kind of asked their opinion and in, in a bit of a blessing because we are not here to compete with the good work that anyone else is doing and she said tone said I love it I think it's great we're more focused on you know memberships and in that aspect and she said anything that we all can do to help build the artist community I am in for so but I do think like that is a great start um I, I think Carol was realistic with me about how difficult it is to obtain the information um, from artists and to manage that. Um, but I, I, we have to flesh out how this looks, but I think what we need to do is create kind of a, a form or a platform, submit three photos, your information. What I think we wanna do right now, if you all are into it, and I love Cami to help with this too. <laughs> Yeah, bandwidth is that we start collecting our database now and then when hopefully the city has a new website in 2024 or at the you know the beginning we're all ready to go so we can launch our page yeah so we're kind of we're getting ahead we're we're not going to have this within the next couple of months but we're going to start um creating curating our artist list now do you guys like this idea I was really excited about it. And yeah. From, oh, perfect. From what, thinking about, and I think we could have performance artists on there. You know, we will have all the, the different, you know, mediums. And I, I love like if we keep talking about how we're, we, we strive to be and we are a vibrant arts and culture community, we need to highlight our community. And I love that it, it will be right on the city page. Um, so, okay, well, I'll start creating that platform and how that looks and working internally, and then I'll let you guys know what keep you apprised on how that looks, and I'm so glad you guys are excited about it as well. All right, and then your other project we were thinking of is 7D. <laughs> yes! Oh my gosh, Ooh. I just got the green light for this. This is... This is something I've been stewing on for a while. Okay, so here we have our amazing 2D wrapped um, utility boxes out in our community. We have a funder for it, STCU. The problem is, is the Avesta program has changed. And so um, it wouldn't be prudent for us to keep wrapping the boxes um, due to their policies. Um, but they, what we have is amazing. I think we have a great uh, selection of historical and, um, you know, artful uh, utility boxes. So STCU came knocking on my door again, and they're like, we have money, let's do a project together. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we got to do something. Um, so I have this idea that we wrap um, the big belly trash cans. The city owns two of them and the rest are in a lease situation. So we have two that we can wrap. And I, so I'm always thinking about how we can have this be like a really powerful program. And I thought about connecting it to our local schools and having a competition where um, children participate in the competition and they have to create a monster. And there's a certain set of criteria, And one of them would be that the drawing would have to have an activated mouth when so the trash can opens and the mouth opens up and um the winning uh uh candidate gets to have their art wrapped on a box and again this is just a new idea i want to bring to you guys but maybe there's like a, a little stipend for the i think of my nine-year-old son and he would be over the moon about having his monster on a trash can publicly um and it would have their name on it um but my goodness, like $50 would be like a huge win for him too. So, well, you know, whatever, whatever kid won would be like, Mom, let's go to my block. Let's see my thing. Right. right. 
brushing their insurance. Yeah, all over their place. exactly. So whether we want to do a stipend or not, um, and then so these two trash cans can be like right downtown. Um, and I just love this idea of like education, children, you know, competition. Right? Yeah, and it's so playful and fun. Do you guys like this idea? I think that's awesome. Good. I guess so I would ask why does it have to be a monster? Why can it not be also a, a local animal, flora, fauna? You know, just. But what, like, fawn eats trash? <laughs> What what about a, fish? <laughs> uh, yeah. a goat it could be a goat <laughs> yeah no, i mean it be, there's a lot of things there you know so i think i think by i i, I, <laughs> no, I appreciate it a little bit more sinister aspect to it <laughs> to have a wider thing it might be a nine years old yeah, yeah i mean my son is like the biggest fan of ghostbusters so i think i am coming from a very personal yeah. moment so i appreciate that <laughs> don't, don't how long would, would they be on there? Would it be oh, forever? Yeah, it's so like the final wrap. Yeah, and then STC will pay for that, and and okay, they'll so be on there. Annual thing or two well, years? It could we could change the theme each time. Well, I hope that maybe we'd buy like more trash cans yeah. and we can continue to do it. We have nine-year-olds picking up the trash for our town. Yeah, there you go. And then we'll be teaching the next generation to I use it. Because it's exciting. We want to motivate them to use it, and that's yeah. Perfect. And I think you can make the trash cans talk too. Um, I know they've done it in other cities. I have to ask Jennifer if, if I can go further for Jennifer, but what if it was like, hmm, yummy, you know, and it was like the cookie monster. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Sorry, you're gonna see Keely at that trash can. So can I start building the program? Are you guys okay? Okay, I think, um, and this brings us to, I mean, more like what what can we do that if we can have a funder um, that can check off all the boxes that we want with public art, like this is a very sustainable public art project that we can do right now. Um, and again, the city owns those. Um, it gets a little tricky when we're dealing with private, with public art on private buildings or objects. Um, so, can I still flesh out monster or do you want me to open it up a little bit more? Creative being? I think kids need a little direction though. Yeah, a more specific direction is better. Yeah. Right? I think monster is cute, personally. We'll make them nice monsters, buddy. Well, like this, they can't this be scary. Kind of sells it, this picture right uh, here. Uh, what do we sell? <laughs> okay, oh, I'm so glad you guys are into it. I, I kept bringing this to Jennifer <laughs> over and over. And over. <laughs> Yeah, the timing was just right. So, so two things like we can officially say that we're working on besides policies and procedures for art. Um, and I think of the walking tour being artful too, but we have that we're gonna start building the artist directory now and um, we're gonna be working on the big um, belly monster project. We have the silver art, um, box. silver box mm -hmm. going. And, and so lots of, lots of fun stuff happening. So that was, it for my idea generation for the moment. Very good. <laughs> Yay. Awesome. Well, then that uh, brings us to uh, AA Around the Room. Um, I'd love to announce that uh, Angel Awards tickets are now on sale on our website, lprf.com. The show dates are May 12th, 13th, 19th, and 20th. Uh, we'll be at the Panada again. And uh, yours truly is Cinderella. Oh, and I'm also Darcy. Nice. Oh my god. Um, but yeah, it's just an amazing, wonderful show. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but it's a Sondheim classic. And it's probably it hasn't been done in Sandpoint since the 90s. So uh, I'm really excited for all up to bring it to Sandpoint and I hope all of you can come support us. Thank you. Ryan, were you gonna present something? I do, but I think I'm going to keep that. Oh, I'm going to uh, elaborate a little bit on the topic, and I have a show and tell. Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to bring that next time, if I may. Yes, please. Yeah, then I have a little bit more time. Perfect. Well, we will officially put you on the agenda under Hidden Treasures. Um, yeah. Well, I hope to see everybody tomorrow night to meet the designers. That's going to be exciting. Yeah. I'm going to say, I work with one of them. 
because I retired. Did you? Okay. Oh, that's very cool. Um, but I won't see. Okay. So yeah, I will have to find out later. Um, I'll be uh, joining through Zoom. Um, so sorry, I won't be able to be there in person. All right. Thank you all for everything you guys do. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for keeping on the